All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome. Happy Friday. We're super glad to have you here with us as we kick off the PEDS Match 21 webinar series with the APPD and COMCEP. My name is Nick Heitkamp. I'm one half of the Future PEDS Res account on Twitter, and we're really excited to have you here. Um, I go to IU School of Medicine, and I'm a fourth year applying pediatrics. And I'm Makala. Um, I'm the other half of Future Peds Res. I'm also a fourth year medical student at WMED. Um, and like Nick said, I'm so excited to be here and so excited to spend the next couple weeks with all of you. All right, so um, this webinar, this whole webinar series was created in collaboration with the Association of Pediatric Program Directors, or the APPD, as well as COMCEP, the Council of, on Medical Student Education in Pediatrics. Um, and it was really overseen by uh, Dr. John Frona, who helped us throughout this entire process. So I'd like to turn it over to you now. Thanks, and I just want to add our welcome. I'll be brief. I think um, on behalf of the Association of Pediatric Program Directors, we're really happy to uh, co-sponsor these events. I think. Um, you know, as program directors, we represented over 200 programs in core pediatrics and hundreds of uh, fellowships in pediatrics. And um, why we do this is because we love working with learners. We love kind of mentoring and teaching people. And so um, we're really happy that you were able to join us tonight. Um, it's, I think uh, I just want to say thanks, especially to Nick and Michaela. They have more energy than I could uh, ever accumulate in my whole lifetime that I've seen in the last couple of weeks. And we could bottle that and... Uh, spread it out it'd be awesome so i think this is going to be a really great time i also want to express our thanks to all of the the people who are participating tonight i think it's a, a great event and we're really happy that you guys could be here wonderful thanks so much for that so a quick slide about um, where we are now and where we're going so in just one second um, makla is going to talk about our brief goals um, really, this webinar is for pediatric applicants, and so we're hoping to base all of our goals uh, on your goals as well. So she's going to outline those. Um, after that, I'll talk about a few ways that we want you, the applicants, to engage during our webinars. And then we're going to get to the heart of everything. We're going to start with our four um, large overarching questions and then get to a lot of your live Q&A at the very end. All right, so like Nick said, we'll start off with the series goals. So essentially, um, we, we wanna provide pediatric residency applicants with number one, foundational knowledge surrounding this crazy virtual interview season. Uh, number two, um, provide well-rounded insight into the benefits of programs by region, which is what you'll see in our upcoming regional sessions. And then number three, uh, devoted time for live Q&A, like you'll see today. And I think it's, it's going to be really nice to get different perspectives from different parts of the country and kind of see how everyone comes together. So because this is a, an applicant-centric um, event, uh, we really are going to be relying on your interaction, your questions, so that we can address exactly what you're interested in. So there are two ways we've identified to do this. The first one, if you have a Twitter account, you can at any time post a question, a comment, a concern um, on Twitter, as long as you include the hashtag that you see in the bottom left of your screen, FPR webinar. If you do that, then our wonderful Twitter moderators, who you will meet in just a second, will be able to field these questions and then bring them up to us at the end. And on the Zoom side of things, it's kind of a similar process. We have some great moderators taking a look at the Zoom Q&A. Uh, so anytime you ask a question in there, these moderators throughout the webinar will try to answer the questions. And again, also save some of them for our live Q&A at the end. Wonderful. So let's get to know our panelists. Um, Michael and I are going to call them by name. We'll have them introduce themselves, where they are from, what, um, what they're involved with, and then we will also ask them to share uh, something fun, a highlight that happened to them this past week. So to start off, um, I am very excited to introduce Dr. Shannon Scott Vernalia. I was going to be the one who forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm Shannon Scott Fernelli, and it's just a true pleasure to be here with you tonight. Um, and I would reiterate with John, like the 
the enthusiasm and um, energy that Nick and Mikola bring to this is really energizing for all of us and really to see um, so many of you engaged in a passion of ours, which is to keep the care of children, I think is what sustains us as program directors. I'm the program director of the Mass General Hospital for Children, which is where I did my own training. Um, I'm a generalist and um, committed to medical education and my um, passions include uh, simulation and physician wellness. Um, one fun thing that's been happening over not just this week, but the last three weeks is my family, which um, includes my husband and two teenage daughters, and I have um, <clears throat> been fostering a dog. Um, for complicated reasons, we aren't a great fit for a long-term dog, but this has been a great quarantine um, uh, event for us since the allergic family members aren't able to visit. So we've um, been going on long walks and having uh, lots of face licks over the last week and our little foster dog's having her first big interview tomorrow and hopefully we'll find her forever home. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. And now I'm going to introduce to you Dr. Akshada Hopkins. Hi, everybody. Um, also wanted to, to just commend um, Nicholas and Michaela for this. It's, it's, it's truly amazing. Um, and it's, it's been fun to, to watch you guys uh, put this all together. Um, so I'm the program director at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital in St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, I am a hospitalist and I enjoy teaching about leadership and I enjoy um, quality improvement and health system sciences and really trying to uh, teach residents and, and learners how those integrate into the everyday of what we do. Um, and as far as a highlight, I would say is, uh, personally, I discovered acrylic pouring paint this week, and that has been a, a lot of fun. I've been able to tap into that um, artistic, artistic creative outlet this week, and that's been great. Awesome. Uh, so next, we have Dr. Elena Griego of uh, Seattle Children. Hi everyone, um, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I am, am Elena Griego. I'm one of the associate program directors for the pediatric residency program at the University of Washington in Seattle Children's Hospital. Um, I work primarily as a hospitalist and um, am really interested in medical education as well as kind of curriculum development and uh, improving evaluation and um, mentorship for our residents. Um, and let's see, uh, an exciting or something exciting from this week is I, much on the dog theme, I had, I will be adopting a puppy who was born yesterday and I'm just super stoked and excited to bring her home in about eight weeks. Awesome, <laughs> that's so exciting. Um, and then our fourth panelist is Dr. Amy Sear of Iowa, University of Iowa Children's Hospital. Well, I'll reiterate again how excited I am to join everybody today as we all gear up for the interview season this year. It's so exciting as a program director to meet people from all over the country. Um, as they said, I am from the University of Iowa. I've been the program director here for about almost 10 years now. And I did all of my training here. Um, so I've been here a long time and I love it. And I have a special interest, of course, in medical education, but I also was named the chief wellness officer for our Department of Pediatrics. So I do a lot with not just resident and learner wellness, but also physician and provider wellness. And I'm gonna basically copy uh, Shannon's because my family and I and my two teenage daughters also got two puppies. They are ours to keep. They're two little dachshunds. And my highlight though, was that this week we had two days that they didn't pee on the floor. So that's my highlight. <laughs> that is awesome. Thanks so much to everybody for introducing themselves. Now I am going to turn it over to our moderators to introduce themselves. We have four moderator roles and five people filling their roles. So the first moderator who I'd like to introduce is Dr. Steve Hannigan. Hey guys, great to see great to see the other panelists, and I'm so happy that so many people tuned in. Uh, I'm Steve Hennigan. I am one of the associate program directors of CMC Pediatrics in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. Um, my career interest, one of my career interests, is value-based care, um, and I I'm in charge of recruitment at my institution, and 
the faculty just everybody gets psyched up for it um july is july we set our calendars by july you know every july we get an infusion of new talent new energy and and this is where it starts for us so so everybody's excited to be here and and share everything that we know and kind of share our fears with you guys um, as we navigate this season together Thanks so much for that. Um, up next, we have a duo from University um, uh, of San Diego in San Diego. And um, so I'm happy to introduce Dr. Vong and Dr. Garcia. Hey everyone, um, I'm the one behind this mask over here. Um, my name is Kimmy. I'm one of the PH chief residents. Actually, all three of us are hanging out in the office. I'm originally from North Carolina, so over from uh, Dr. Hannigan's hood. Um, and now I'm all the way over here on the West Coast, West Coast. I'm going into um, nephrology, uh, hopefully critical care nephrology, so I'm applying this cycle. And we're just super honored and privileged to be on this panel and to work with these wonderful organizers. We're super appreciative and we're always here to answer questions regardless of whether you're even looking at San Diego. So welcome everyone. And I'm Kirsten Garcia, I'm the other duo on this uh, Peach Chief account. And I'm from Michigan originally, but migrated to the West Coast, West Coast <laughs> for a residency. Um, I'm going into neonatology and I'm just really excited to get to work with everyone and get to meet all of you guys through Twitter. Welcome everybody. Welcome. Awesome. Um, and on the Zoom side, our first Zoom moderator is Dr. Jonathan Awari, um, Chief Resident at um, Seattle Children's. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan Awari. I'm one of the chief residents here at Seattle Children's Hospital. I am originally from uh, Nairobi, Kenya, and come to Seattle Children's via University of Michigan Medical School. Um, my primary interests are uh, medical humanities, uh, pediatric cardiology, and global health. So wherever those three can intersect, I am definitely in a happy place. Um, I am, I'm sorry if this is disappointing. I did not just get a puppy, uh, but uh, I'm inspired now to, to look at my options. Uh, but what did happen that I was, did that I'd never done before, that I'd never gone tubing. I was pulled by a boat recently. I'm still alive to tell the tale. I had a great time and I'm looking forward to interacting with everybody here today. Thank you. Awesome. And then our uh, second Zoom moderator is Dr. Chelsea Del Rosso also um, Chief Resident at Seattle Children's. Hey everyone, I'm Chelsea Del Rosso, and um, thank you so much for having us here today. I'm originally from Missouri, and I went to medical school at St. Louis University, then made my way out west uh, to Seattle, and it is a great place to be. The, um, I'm interested in going into general pediatrics and still deciding if I want to do a fellowship in pediatric emergency medicine, so stay tuned for that. Um, and the thing that happened to me this week, which is unfortunately a rare thing in times of COVID, is I got to meet one of my best friend's babies last night, who's now um, five weeks old, and that was really wonderful. is exciting. Thanks again to everybody. Now let's get to the heart of our questions. And they're all around the virtual interview season. So our first question, we're going to go back to Dr. Scott Vernalia. So um, I'm excited to kind of think about this question with you about how you as students um, show interest and market yourselves um, to us as programs and program directors, in part because it gives me a little bit of peace of mind to get out of my own head. And I think where all of us have been, which is thinking about how we market ourselves and show our interest to you. So I guess I would start by just trying to remind everyone that we are all in this new world together and we're all nervous together and kind of, you know, finding exciting opportunities, but also um, kind of are figuring it out together. So I hope that that is reassuring to you. It's certainly reassuring to me that you guys are also um, kind of figuring it out with us. So one of the things I want to reassure people about is that <clears throat> while there were previously the opportunities to do away rotations, they were still limited. A student might have had the chance to go to one place or maybe an, on occasion two. So most of the applicants that we were all reviewing and kind of that became our future residency classes were people who didn't have the chance to do an away elective. So while I know you may have been really excited to do that rotation, I also wanna reassure folks that that's a tiny part of what went into our decisions ever. And that I think by leveling the playing field, in many ways, this is an opportunity for all because doing away rotations um, 
had lots of, you know, kind of caveats and costs and things that made it not always an opportunity for everyone. Um, so I want to reassure folks about the away rotations. I do think your in-person um, interviews, while they won't be in person, we're all starting to figure out that you actually can meet people in two dimensions across this crazy platform called Zoom or the many other platforms out there. And so I would encourage you to plan to use your interviews to get to know programs and to have the programs get to know you. Some of the best ways you can demonstrate your interests are having really looked into a program beforehand. Know what they have to offer and think about what questions you have based on the things that they've put out there on the web or sent to you by video, whatever it is that may be part of the, the package that they're showing you. And so <clears throat> you want to be able to already know something about them and that's going to show your interest. If you are really interested in going to a part of the country that you know you haven't been to before, say that. Um, it is, we're always interested to figure out why you might want to come to wherever our programs are. So I think that's another way that you can show interest when you're talking with residents during the process, to program directors and to your interviewers. The other thing that I think is really important is you show interest by applying to our programs. And I'm going to take a moment to just try to reiterate the recommendations that the APPD and COMCEP have sent out to all of your clerkship directors, which is that <clears throat> for those who have no major issues in their academic record and that you would talk through with your own advisors, the recommendation is between not to apply to more than 15 to 16 programs. And Bob Vinci and others, um, a dear friend of all of ours, um, put together um, a paper about three years ago showing that um, pediatric applicants who had no red flags in their applications, if they ranked 10 programs, had a 99% chance of matching. So when you keep a tailored list as you apply, you are showing us your interest and you're also helping us to really um, make room in the interview process for those who are most interested in a given program. So I would encourage you to think about that and just get to know people and programs. Many of us are doing all sorts of different kinds of webinars and videos out there. So poke around on the web, figure out what um, pieces of culture you can see um, and get to know programs that way. Talk to um, former uh, alums from your own medical schools who may have gone to certain programs and even talk to them about places they didn't go because those who apply um, often are making decisions for a lot of different reasons, including geography. They may have loved a program that didn't make a geographical fit for them or was a couples match issue, um, but they may be able to tell you a lot of things about that program and how they really liked it. So um, I would encourage you to talk to alums and to current residents and programs. All right, for our second question, we're going to Dr. Akshata Hopkins. Thank you. Um, this, I think a great segue from, uh, from Shannon's, Shannon's question about, um, you know, given the, the virtual nature of the season, how do you get to know the culture? And uh, really thinking about what does that mean? What is, uh, when we talk about culture, and as, as Shannon kind of alluded to, it's the story, right? It's, it's your story, and it's our story. And it's, us trying to kind of figure out um, where they kind of align. Um, so I think there's two parts to this question, um, one that's more broad and then some that's a, a little bit more granular. You know, when um, we've always been able to say, and I think that's part of some of the uncertainty and uh, that people feel is, you know, when you ask uh, med students from last year when they were interviewing and, and in the past, it's been like, okay, well, how did you know when it's always been, well, you just, you just trust your gut, right? You just trust your gut. Um, and you, we've always relied on an entire experience. And so, um, and applicants, I'm sure you feel that way. And, and like Shannon also said, the programs, we're feeling that way too. And so we're going to, to, to really uh, learn and, and, and work together um, to really identify um, some of these other natural cues that we can find. And, and as a community, um, in APPD and you're gonna get and you're gonna get exceptional training, right? You're gonna get exceptional training. You're gonna be a pediatrician when you graduate um, residency. 
And so it, it's really a time to, for applicants and programs, programs too, for us to really reflect and be able to articulate what, where we want. Um, so for applicants, you know, what's important to you? What, what, when, when you have a day off, what do you want to do for fun? Um, is it being close to family and um, how big the program is? It's a community or academic, like all of those pieces, what are your values? And I think really being intentional and, and identifying maybe two or three things that are those values of a culture that you're looking for and kind of being consistent and with all of the programs that you interview at, then kind of comparing it that way. Um, that's something that, that I think would be helpful. Um, as a program, you know, for the last few years, we've really, we've worked on it, and I think everyone's worked on um, articulating, you know, what, what are we all looking for um, in residence, and, you know, what are the missions of, of different programs, and for us to really just be authentic and transparent and deliberate and, and have honest conversations, and I think um, that's what these are. We're honest, these are honest conversations, and, and we're really, um, our goal is for both parties to be successful. Um, and I think those are such important pieces. So I would reiterate kind of the granular pieces of really reaching out to people and asking and, um, you know, even the cities, like trying to understand what the city's like. Um, I know social media is a big piece of it as well. Um, all of those things kind of combined. And I too am starting to realize like even with um, so much of these virtual um, Zoom meetings and sessions. I've met a lot of interesting and cool and awesome people and friends and new colleagues and networks that I had not had before. So I think this is a great opportunity um, to, to really kind of expand our wings on, on that part. Wonderful, thanks so much. Okay. Uh, moving on to our third question, just a quick reminder, we're taking all of your Q&A. They're starting to roll in, but don't wait until the end to send them. So if you have questions, go ahead and click the Q&A box at the bottom right now. And our um, two uh, PEDS colleagues on the West Coast are already getting to your answers. And with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Griego. Excellent. Well, um, so this question, I think, is something that we've been hearing a lot from applicants or prospective applicants and students. And I want to start just by reassuring everyone that you're all in this together and, and your pediatric programs that you're applying to know that your applications might look a little bit different this year. Um, and that is expected and we recognize that that is kind of part of the process. Um, but at the same time, I want to also reassure you that in our minds, the process hasn't changed that much in that we, as pediatric programs, really try to take a um, big picture view of every applicant that comes through our doors and um, really look comprehensively at your applications. And it's not just about one test score or one clinical rotation or having that like coveted letter of recommendation. Um, and so I just wanna assure you guys that from our end, at least, from the program directors, this doesn't look much different to us. We're really still going to be looking at your applications in the same way. Um, and that the, you know, APPD as a whole has really kind of agreed that we're going to take these comprehensive looks um, and that it's not just about uh, board scores or step scores or things like that. So um, I think the the big thing to take away from this type of question is that we don't want you to worry about it. Um, we want you to tell us your story, tell us who you are, um, and that comes through in your um, CV as well as your personal statement. Just keep doing those things and that will tell us who you are as an applicant, um, much more so than any of um, these things listed in the question. All right, and our fourth question uh, goes to Dr. Amy Steer. Uh, so my question is really a little bit more practical. It's how do you prepare for the interview day specifically and all of the logistics that we're all learning. And I think I'm gonna reiterate a lot of the things that have already been said, but I think the first thing is to just relax. 
we are all learning this over the course of the last several months and everybody who's been on a, any zoom call has seen at least something go wrong at some point so so it will and i think that's something that we need to as program directors recognize too that a lot of this well sort of all of 2020 has been out of our control right and so relax and we're all we're all trying to figure it out together so so be patient with yourself as well as with the programs that you're connecting with the second thing I would say is to prepare and we're all in the medical field and so we know how important that is I think things like um, making sure that you have an um, you have questions planned. Just prepare yourself just like you would for a regular interview that you're doing in person. Um, think about how Zoom works and how your background looks and um, make sure your camera is set up so that we're not looking up your nose and you're not looking at funny things. I, mean, I think those things are practical and reasonable and probably things all of you have been working on already. And then the last thing that I think, again, has been said already is to be intentional. When you think about your first impression that you make as a candidate, when you turn on that Zoom call, what do you want it to be? Um, we're all trying to make our good first impression too. And so think about what your background looks like or how you're dressed or all of the things that you would do in person. But also please, um, and I say this as a program director, show me your personality. I love to find out little things about candidates that I can't find out in, in an application. And so things like um, what kind of books you like to read or what your favorite things are. Um, again, being, being careful about also the impression that you want to portray. I think it all kind of goes together much like it does in an in-person interview. That practice, with colleagues of yours, with candidates, with program directors, with clerkship directors, I think is key because all of us are sort of doing it at the same time and can work out the kinks of noticing that um, your lighting is funny or that um, your background is distracting. One of the things that we also talked about that I think is worth mentioning is virtual backgrounds. Um, all of us have different things in our back um, that can be either distracting or positive. And many people use virtual backgrounds, some of which you can't even tell. Um, so, but the APPD and many of our organizations kind of talked about that most of the time virtual backgrounds are discouraged. So unless you have one that's very subtle that someone might not even know it's a virtual background, we would suggest as sort of a, a group that you try and find something a little um, more natural. Wonderful, thank you so much. So this marks the halfway point of our hour together. Um, as we transition to our um, live Q&A session, um, I would just remind everybody that um, we are happy to take any questions you have. We're going to try to field um, the most common or those that we think are most pertinent. And um, our moderators will begin to address them and then also call on help from our panelists. If we don't get your questions answered today, don't worry. We will get to them. We have a second kickoff session that has been rescheduled to 9-14, the 14th of September, and we're gonna have all of that information for you at the very end. Okay, so it is now time to start answering some questions. First question, I'm gonna to go to um, Dr. Hannigan. Dr. Hannigan, how has Twitter been? What do we have going on? Twitter, there's been a lot of back and forth between myself and the UCSD Chiefs. Um, we do have a question from Ryan Fox Lee, at Ryan Fox Lee, um, and he said, um, he said, I, I rely on my gut sense of what a place is like by being in the place and meeting the folks in person. And that's just not an option that you, this year. It's scary to think of matching to a program for three years, no matter how great sight unseen. And my response to that is, yeah, man, we feel it too. Uh, so programs, I think you see programs doing things like this. Uh, you see programs really bulking up their social media plat their social media um, uh, platforms or their social media presence. Um, and, and know that this year's interview season is going to be very different from all the programs too, whether it's virtual tours or enhanced video content. Um, every, we feel that pressure too to, to show you who we are. So, so we're going to do the best that we can to make sure that we're not, we're not leaving you there just picking a name out of a hat. Awesome. Um, so now let's go over to Zoom. Um, so Dr. Owari, any any. Great questions coming out of the Zoom chat. 
want to um, unmute. Oh yeah, we're unmuted. Oh, we're perfect. ready to go. Yeah, so we have quite a few questions coming in here. I, I think one of the ones that has come up quite a bit is sort of timing of communication. Um, whether or not, uh, what, what sort of communication should, especially pre-interview. Uh, quite a few people are, are interested in knowing whether or not they should reach out to programs to indicate their willingness to move to a particular part of the country pre-interview. Uh, what sort of pre-interview communication is um, sort of a, appropriate or, or, or encouraged or, or, uh, or necessary? So uh, quite a few questions on that, around that theme. Wonderful. Uh, so, so, so we just read that. So, sorry, we were just um, putting that out. And, and so what we've, what we've generally been mentioning is that um, it's perfectly appropriate to, um, uh, to reach out to current residents um, and, and another, you know, an, another uh, uh, officials in the program, not so much with the, with the, with the broad goal of, of selling yourself per se, but really just to, 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 out of interest to get the questions that you, that you need answered, recognizing as well with the limitation of, um, of not being able to get there, a surrogate, the person who's been through the experience is one of the most valuable people that you can, that you can contact. Um, it's interesting, as we were talking, this actually made me think about the experience of thousands of international students every year who even pre-COVID um, have to go precisely through this. They often cannot travel. When I was leaving Kenya to go to Canada, I definitely didn't have a chance to see McGill before I went there. But I had a cousin who had been there. I had friends who had been there. And this is often the way that you get a sense of culture and get some of those more on the ground questions that are trickier to answer if you can't physically be there. All right, and we'll do one more uh, Zoom question. Um, we'll throw it to you, Chelsea. So um, it, the one of the questions that I thought was pretty broadly applicable to everybody that was asked is, what are some questions that applicants should be asking residents uh, when we're going through this Zoom platform? And really, the thing that you want to make sure that you are investigating when you can't be in the place is, uh, what like what do people like to do like outside of work and what are people um, what are people engaging in what are their hobbies are they are they happy at work do they feel supported what's the mentorship like um, really just questions that broadly get at are people happy and excited to go to work and um, are they feeling well supported in the community that's created at the residency program are incredibly important questions uh, to ask. And like Jonathan was saying, asking those to residents, uh, uh, current as well as past residents, as well as chief residents, are gonna be the folks who can speak to that the most. Perfect, that, that's great. I, I appreciate so much your feedback and your, uh, um, uh, your help with us. Um, so I wanna turn it back to the panelists really quick. Um, just in case any of these questions has sparked something in your mind that um, you would like to bring up. There was something said particularly about um, communication and dress um, for interviews. So I just wanted to see if you guys had any feedback. Around communication, I guess one thing I would add is that in this pre-applicant part of the time, um, uh, typically, very few people were actually visiting in this period, too. So you're in a very similar spot to applicants for, for forever. Um, so I would think more about how after you've applied to given programs and been um, offered interviews at different programs that you then think about um, kind of during that interview time um, and your, um, when you're communicating on your interview day, expressing your interest. Certainly there are times where it makes a lot of sense to reach out ahead of time, but if you sort of multiply the number of applicants by the number of programs, um, we could all quickly get um, inundated and unable to reply to the number of um, uh, requests that might come in. So I would definitely kind of like be doing your homework, seeing what's out there, talking to people who've been to a program or kind of might have interviewed. Um, but just remember that everybody's madly trying to figure out what their virtual season is going to look like. And so we're, everybody's pretty busy right now. Um, and then I'll, I'll speak to the clothing question. I know there was um, at least one question in the chat about, um, do I have to buy a suit? 
Um, I would have told you previously you didn't have to buy a suit. Um, we are pediatricians. Um, you uh, should look a way, in a way that you feel you're happy to present to yourself. Um, and we've been encouraged as program directors to make it clear what type of clothing is expected, like business casual versus kind of more interview um, clothing, but that doesn't have to be a suit no matter what. Do be sure that you have bottoms on so that you don't inadvertently stand up. Um, we're giving our interviewers the same types of advice um, and be sure that it's comfortable for sitting. Um, I actually think that's more important than anything else. You want to um, present what you want to look like and um, you want to be able to get through all of that sitting. So something that's uncomfortable but like looks perfect um, isn't probably the right combination. Um, for happy hours, programs will, we are uh, all being encouraged and I think all will expect to tell you what to expect. Like, is having a drink with you acceptable? Is wearing, you know, a t-shirt fine? Um, and I think most places want to have some laid back time, but I would check in on that. And if that isn't communicated, that is totally fair game to ask. Thank you, Dr. Scott Vernalia. Um, speaking of happy hours, I just want to mention one thing is when we start our regional tour beginning next week with the West Coast, we will be offering an optional 30 minute happy hour with the residents of that region just before the webinar, using it as a chance to confidentially uh, express your thoughts, get the, get the true questions that you wanna ask but are too afraid to ask anybody else and um, enjoy yourself and get, get ready for the webinar to start afterward. Okay, wonderful. So uh, we've got some uh, stuff continuing on Twitter. So Kimmy Vong, wh what do we have going on? Hey everyone, there's been such great discussion. Um, Nikki on Twitter had a great question that I'm sure a lot of people have been asking. Her question was, are programs planning to do the same number of interviews or more due to the current guidelines? Um, so as I'd love to kind of hear from the panelists from their specific institutions. I know at our institution, it's a little bit of kind of, we're not really sure how many applications to expect. So we're kind of creating like different game plans depending on that scenario. Um, but, you know, I think it really, it's really important to try to focus on those 15 applications if possible, because you really want to show programs that you're super interested. But I'd love to hear what the panelists have to say from their perspective too. I'd be happy to jump in. Uh, Amy Steer from the University of Iowa. And I think that, um, so we are in very much this Uh-oh, looks like we lost Dr. Steer. Do any of our panelists want to jump in while her connection is uh, coming back? Yeah. Hey, this is Steve Hannigan. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Hopkins. All right. So yeah, we're interviewing uh, a few more people. So uh, between 30 and 50 more applicants this year. Um, we don't really know what to expect, to be honest, uh, but we want to make sure that, that we have the capacity to, to interview more applicants. So um, we, we have room to interview even more applicants if we need to. Um, we've added uh, an afternoon session to come our morning session, um, just so that it's, it's more intimate. Um, and we want to accommodate as many people as we can. Anyone else? Uh, other questions? Dr. Steer, did you want to, do you want to jump back in? Hopefully. Um, I was basically going to say that we're interviewing about the same number of people and we expect that we, if people are following the guidelines of um, interviewing and applying where they're actually really interested, that we'll be able to continue that. Okay, wonderful. All right. Well, um, we have a ton of Zoom questions coming in. So um, does anybody uh, on Zoom, um, our, our correspondents, want to uh, open a question up? Certainly. Sure. We seem to be getting a lot of questions from uh, re regarding the approach to applications from non-U.S. international medical graduates. Uh, I think this is probably one that would be helpful to hear from the panelists. As I, I imagine there might be some variation in terms of how the, the, uh, the applications are generally reviewed, uh, what kind of uh, immigration support there might be relative to, let's say, immigration statuses, including H1, uh, H1 visas and so forth. So I think this might be one that would be helpful to hear from the, from the panelists broadly um, in terms of uh, non-US uh, international medical graduates.
I think this is this is a really tough question to answer in a broad way. I think that the best advice that I can give and, and other others may have different thoughts is um, to contact the programs directly and kind of get a sense of what um, what they are able to offer in terms of um, support and to take a look at their current residents and see, you know, are there IMGs within the residency program? Um, reach out to those individuals and see if you can ask specific questions about the application process and just what that looked like to them. Um, because I think, unfortunately, for for each program, that's going to look really different depending on um, like where they're based, what university they're based out of, all sorts of different factors. And so I think um, doing a little bit more targeted um, uh, question asking early on in the application process is probably worthwhile, but um, I would love to hear if other folks have um, input too. Uh, uh, this is Akshata um, from uh, St. Petersburg. Um, I, I, I agree um, and, and kind of go along the same, the same lines is, is that it is hard to kind of answer it on, on, a, on a broader scale. Um, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of programs make sure that uh, that's also somewhat answered either in their FAQs or uh, certain parts of their website. Um, and so I think that may be a good place to start and always like don't hesitate in reaching out um, either by phone call or email. Um, and that's not any different um, than past years. And kind of linking that question to uh, one of the other questions about just geographic location, um, I, you know, one of the biggest elements and one of the most fun pieces as, as program directors is kind of seeing the diversity and, and, and different, um, different stories that are coming through. Um, and so, you know, everyone's got a reason for why they're applying and that, that goes back to that intentionality piece. Um, and it, it shouldn't make a difference um, other than knowing why you're applying to the program. Um, and so that's, yeah. Uh, one other question, uh, a kind of question that has come in is uh, sort of this logistics of the day and exactly how, uh, let's say, breaks will work in the day, how to handle things like the need to move or take medication or go to the bathroom and so forth. Um, and I guess where I would begin to answer that is as soon as you have some kind of schedule for the day and some sort of idea of how it will break down, uh, I would look at that and see if that's compatible with what you need. And if there are any special needs that don't quite fit into the time frames of what you are seeing in the schedule, I think it's perfectly appropriate to sort of mention that perhaps at the beginning in that sort of uh, co collective time to say, uh, by the way, I have this particular need relative to medication or relative to getting off the screen and seeing what sort of uh, uh, adjustment might be. Um, I'm sure the programs would be ready to, uh, to you know, to accommodate that. Uh, one other quick tip that I would throw out there from my fellowship interview uh, just a quick uh, thing to keep in mind is when you are actually in a breakout room, for example, uh, these breakout rooms tend to have this countdown like uh, that lets you know that you have about 30 seconds left and then things get very dramatic as you're quickly shifted back to a different room. So I would encourage you, if you notice that's happening um, and you really want to help end it in a smoother way, if you notice that's, that's winding down, it's perfectly, again, appropriate to say, you know, just before we, run, we, you know, we get out of here, I just want to get a chance to just to say thank you and, uh, and, and, and help wrap up the interview in a more natural way. Because in some ways, sometimes your interviewer is just as new to the process as you. And it's uh, perfectly fine to work together to have a slightly smoother landing uh, with your interview. Great. Um, and now we'll move back to Twitter to Dr. Garcia. And also just wanted to take a second to mention um, for all of our audience and participants to just use the uh, Twitter Q&A. Um, we won't be using the chat during um, this webinar. Awesome. So we actually got a great question um, on Twitter from Daniel. And it was asking about kind of for those people who don't have a specific office space, um, would a neatly made, you know, made bed in the background be okay? Um, and types, you know, kind of similar type questions. Um, we were talking about it and, you know, clearly our office is a little busier <laughs> than you would probably want for your um, interview space, but a neatly made bed, um, anything that's not as distracting. And one thing that actually came up in Twitter was um, 
reaching out to your medical school or even your local residency program, if there's a PEDS program, to try to ask them if there is some space you can use. Um, because sometimes they do have empty office spaces lying around, especially in the era of COVID. I will say that for our residents who are applying for fellowship, we've gone out of our way to find out um, who would like to borrow some space for this. So I actually think there's a lot of room um, to do that. Um, I, no one should be afraid of a well-made bed um, at all. Um, but if you'd feel more comfortable in a different setting, you know, we had one resident who said, I just don't want to be in my, you know, uh, one room apartment. And so, um, but you just want to check your technology where you will be doing your interview. Great, wonderful, awesome. Thanks so much. Um, all right, I think it's time to go back to Dr. Hannigan. Dr. Hannigan, how are the UCSD chiefs treating you on Twitter right now? Man, it's a tough world out there. Um, that's why you got to stay on the East Coast. Um, I, uh, I don't have any other questions from Twitter, although I am continuing to check constantly. Wonderful. Is there anything that you would like to add? Anything cool that you've seen come through so far? Honestly, it's nice. There was just a comment um, by uh, Delara Onur, and she said, very impressed, thrilled, welcomed by the FPR webinar having to add future PEDS. Res. I feel so much better about the application season as it seems like PDs and residents are putting in a lot of effort to try and make this virtual experience approachable and holistic. Um, and that's great. I mean, we, we, we recognize this is a, an unusual circumstance, hopefully something that we, we don't have to deal with ever again. Um, and, and we want everybody to be seeking applicants that fit. So I think you just want to, we, we want to empower our future residents to be successful. Um, and we recognize that all of us recognize it may not be at our program, it may be somewhere else, but we, we want to help everybody find that perfect fit. Awesome. It's always nice to hear those comments through Twitter as well, but also don't be afraid to ask questions on Twitter <laughs> um, with the hashtag FPR webinar, um, which you can see down um, on our slide as well. But as you're asking your questions on Twitter, we'll move back to Zoom um, and back to you, uh, Dr. Uh, Del Rosso. All right. Well, we have quite a few over here on Zoom. It's a very exciting world um, on the Zoom Q&A. A couple things that have come up a few times uh, are one, uh, program director communication prior to the interview day. And Jonathan and I would like to ask all the program directors on the call what your perspective would, um, would be for that, uh, just so we can give a good message to all of the folks. And then I have a few more comments afterwards, but I'll turn it over to one of the PBs to take that question. I can answer it. <laughs> um, I wanted to, to clarify kind of the, the question. Um, is it uh, asking kind of what the expectation or like what the rules are? So um, really, if, a, if an applicant is interested in a program, should they be reaching out to the program director prior to even an interview being scheduled, given that they want to um, uh, show their significant interest in this time when now it might be a little bit more difficult. So what really should program director and interviewee uh, communication look like in this virtual era? Um, I can, uh, you know, I think it's, and when we're trying to make sure that we're kind of equitable and, and um, really looking at like an, a holistic approach, um, I, I personally wouldn't necessarily look at that any differently and, and really wait kind of for the application um, and sort of what a couple of the other panelists um, had had mentioned now, if there are specific questions like, um, like uh, as far as uh, IMG questions that had come up as far as whether the, the application should kind of um, go through and, and things like that, I think that would be helpful, but, but otherwise, um, I, I kind of look to, um, I think someone had mentioned, um, John, I don't know if you have any comments from APPD, um, from that perspective as well. Sure. And, um, we'll be talking a little bit about this more at the next kickoff event in terms of some of the guidelines and we can definitely make the 
APPD guidelines available to all of you who are participating in this tonight. But um, we've kind of set out some expectations for um, programs and for applicants. And one of those is more sort of on the back end in terms of communication that we really want to try to keep things equitable and not have some of the, you know, um, back and forth love notes kind of things sort of things like that. Um, you know, in general, from the NRMP rules, I always say it's a, you can tell, but you can't ask. And so if you want to tell a program that you're interested in them, you can do that. And if a program wants to tell you that they're interested in you, they can do that. The problem is um, it's hard to know what to make of that and, and, you know, where you are on the list and all that other kind of stuff. So it gets to be a little bit of a back and forth. So generally what we've recommended from APPD this year is to um, limit uh, post-interview communications to sort of essential updates from the program to the applicants or from the applicant to the program. Um, you know, most times those things can go through a coordinator if there's a resident you want to talk to or whatever. As programs, we want you to understand our program, talk to the people that you, will help you make those decisions, all that kind of stuff. But to try to do it to, you know, let us know that you're interested more. There's been this thing about people sending out um, letters of intent, like, you know, if you're a basketball player or something like that. I think that's not very helpful um, and just kind of distracts from things. From the, from the pre-interview side, I think we're hoping that most people will just utilize websites and social media events like this to kind of learn more about the programs. Um, I think if there's something you're really particularly interested in that you want to find out more, I think contacting the program is okay. But obviously if we get, you know, for our program, well, for any programs that get, are getting hundreds of applications to be able to field hundreds of questions about the program that um, people want, that's, that's a little tougher to do. So I think, you know, limited in a fashion that, you know, the program you're, you're very interested in, it helps if you've got somebody in the program that you know that you can contact, you know, from one of your um, former um, classmates or something like that. But uh, I think trying to minimize the communication and just uh, use the resources available is probably the best thing just to kind of keep it fair. Um, there's also, if I could just address, there was also a question about second looks. Same thing where there are, second looks are not allowed basically under the um, guidelines because we want to keep it fair. Even for um, place, people at your own institution, they're, they're discouraged. We're not really allowing even second looks from that. We want to, we want to keep a level playing field and everything consistent for everybody. Thanks so much, Dr. Forna, that's really helpful. I think we've come to the point where we're gonna take our last uh, Q&A question, and this happens to be from Twitter with Kimmy Vong. Hey, okay, we had a really great question that I'm sure is on a lot of people's minds. This one was submitted by Daniel, so thank you for that. The question is, with the interview season being completely virtual, will taking advantage of our computers be allowed as part of interview etiquette? Examples being typing, taking notes, reading off prepared questions on a Word doc versus memorizing. This is a really good question. Um, personally, you know, I kind of pulled the rest of our chief residents as well. I would avoid kind of typing just because, you know, while you're talking, it makes that like click, click, click noise. Um, but, you know, if you have like little sticky notes or something, I don't think anyone would fault you for that. The important thing as with any interview is to kind of have this like genuine, authentic experience and exchange with your interviewer. So I would kind of, do, you know, try to lean away from truly scripted answers. Um, but if those types of things, little reminders will help you feel more comfortable, I don't think anyone would hold it against you. Um, and I welcome the panelists to add anything as well to that. I was going to say also, uh, yes, on all, all of those, all of those pieces um, and being mindful of alarms that go off on your computer whether it's the calendar, the 15 minute before the next, you know, and you're like, I didn't know I had that on my calendar, you know. So being careful and, and making sure about those as well as your Apple Watch um, and phones because any of those little um, distractions can kind of take away from um, being present in, in, in the moment of, of this conversation. Um, I think um, also just um, letting people know, you know, I'm going to take a few notes. I just want to let you know um, can really help because, um, or my toddlers in the other room, <laughs> and there's a chance that they're going to come banging at the door. I think that's okay. We're all humans and we know you're humans. Um, but I think it's the like, well, are they tweeting while they're talking to me or are they kind of writing some notes or something like that? So we are, you know, there's always been a style of some applicants who come and write a lot, some who like have a couple things written down because they, it's, you know, the, the anxiety of the moment is harder to remember their questions. Um, I think just realizing that we only see this little piece 
and helping the interviewer know what it is that may look like you're distracted, but it isn't, it's really that you're paying a lot of attention. I brought the APPD notes so that I could refer to them and make sure that I stayed on uh, task if I answered a question around what, um, that, that overlapped with the recommendation, so. Great, so before we get to our closing remarks, and thank you all for joining us uh, today, I'm gonna um, throw it back to Dr. Frona um, for, for some last um, bits of information. Um, and also, um, you know, never fear, we'll, we'll get to all of your questions uh, one way or another, like Nick said, either through continuing um, Twitter interaction uh, throughout the coming days, um, in the next webinars, et cetera. So um, stay tuned to get your question answered. I just wanted to come back with, I just saw one more question that had come up a couple of times about um, acknowledging that students may not have had, you know, their sub I done yet when they're applying, or they might not have had a lot of PEDS rotations because of COVID. We all recognize that. And so again, the APPD has said, you know, if you have a minimum of one PEDS letter, that's sufficient. Um, if you haven't done your sub I, that's okay. Um, all those types of things, you don't need to, to stress about those. And I, I will, um, I'll, I'll have to, we'll have to send out the um, copy of the letter afterwards. Your, your clerkship directors all received it too at your med school. So if you want to check with them, you could also get the copy there. But that's really kind of the, the Bible, if you will, of what we're all adhering to this year in terms of uh, the interview process. So that should help alleviate a lot of concerns. All right, um, PEDS Match 21, the first of a seven part series is done. Thank you for showing up. Thanks to all of our panelists. Uh, we quite literally could not have done it with everybody's help, without everybody's help. Um, here are two Q QR codes that you're welcome to use now um, ahead of our next two. So next um, week on the 11th, we'll be heading to the West Coast. I'm sure we'll see lots more of San Diego and everybody else on the West Coast. And then on the 14th, we will have our second series of the kickoff, including, uh, and then don't forget about our happy hour before the West Coast session. So um, we are so happy to be able to spend an hour with you guys for the next several weeks um, each Friday night. Um, the conversation continues on Twitter, so find us there. And until next time, thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.